Morning, First Baptist Church. We're now on the 29th of November, four more weeks to Christmas. This period of the church calendar is called the Advent. This is when we prepare for the coming of the Lord. And so what we're going to do is have a series of sermons that actually uh, tell of the coming of the Lord. We usually deal with a bit of prophecy during this particular time. So today, the topic of the sermon is the tale of the lion, the root, and the lamb, the true nature of power. We look into the three prophecies about the coming of Jesus. So let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we ask that you be with us this morning. Help us understand the prophecies that talk of the coming of your Son. We pray, O Lord, that these will guide us to understand the nature of true power in our lives. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, let's get started with the wise men and Herod, Matthew chapter 2. You remember, the wise men were following a star. And they were following the star and they came upon Herod. And Herod was asking, why are you following the star? Well, because they had a prophecy. And this is the prophecy, Matthew 2, 5. They told him, oh, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So this is a prophecy which the told of the coming of a new ruler, a king, which the wise men were trying to follow. On the other side of the field, far away, there was a bunch of shepherds. And when Jesus was born, they shouted out, Fear not, for behold, I bring you a good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And here you actually have two scenes. On one hand, the, fear, the, the, the scene of joy. On the other hand, the massacre of the innocents. Then Herod, when he heard that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under. Christmas is mixed. On one hand, news of a great joy. On the other hand, News of great sorrow when the women and the mothers are all crying because their children under the age of two are all massacred. And that's the irony of Christmas, isn't it? And the irony is because of the misunderstanding of power. Herod the Great at that time, when he heard there was a new ruler coming, when he heard there was a new king coming, he got afraid. There was a clash of power. And if you actually understood Herod the Great, he was a terrible ruler. He had 10 wives and he had children of the three wives actually killed. He was so paranoid about losing power that when his brother-in-law invited the chief priest to come to his swimming pool, he actually was worried that they were planning a coup. So he had the chief, he had his brother-in-law killed. He had his favorite wife, Mariam, killed. He had her grandfather killed. And, and this is the kind of person he was, and when he realized there was a new ruler coming, there was a king coming on, he immediately felt his power was threatened, therefore he reacted. Here we have Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and just for the Passover, riding on a donkey, he was adulated by the crowd. He had the power of the crowd, and this actually caused the Roman, the, the Jewish authorities and the Romans to actually put him to death not soon after this. Just like Herod. China's leaders, President Xi Jinping, is terrified of religion, just like President Mao in those days. Religion, he says, represents a threat to his authority, a potential Achilles heel of the communist infrastructure. Reinhold Niebuhr, who is basically one of the most foremost uh, theologians in America, actually wrote about society. He said, all of life is an expression of power. Human life as other life must have power to exist. The relationship of life to life is therefore a relationship of power to power. And it's true, isn't it? If you look in our own society, there are different centers of power, whether it be government, whether it be rulers, whether it be the courts, family, political powers, even in church. They all exist in power relationships, and each one is trying to vie, to, to vie for power in a struggle, in a competition. 
uh, we can see how finally after 60 years, after so many years, uh, the government changed hand. And since then, power struggles between these two men. And after that, new government comes to place, power struggle between these two, and then current more power struggle. There seems to be a linear characteristic of power. I've got power and you want it. And that's the problem. We even see this power struggle in families, husbands and wives, teenagers rebelling against the authority of their parents. Why can't we forgive each other? When we have a discussion on when the word comes to life, why can't we forgive each other? Because when you actually hurt someone else, we've diminished their power. We cannot forgive because we've lost the power and we want it back. Look at Jesus' own disciples, John 15, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. Jesus withdrew again into the mountains by himself. See, even with the people, when they saw that Jesus did miracles, Jesus fed the 5,000, immediately they recognized this is a center of power. The dynamics of the nation will change and suddenly they want to make him king and overthrow the government of the Romans. What about Jesus' own disciples? James and John, Matthew 10, 37, and they said, grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in glory. What about Peter when they came to arrest Jesus? Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. Jesus thankfully put it back. So with this misunderstanding of power even bleeds into the church where a lot of churches will, will relish having spiritual power. Spiritual. Why do we want spiritual gifts? Because spiritual gifts represent spiritual power, power which we can wield and change the dynamics between relationships. Christmas unveils the true nature of power. We misunderstand power. True power comes from God. And we cannot understand it apart from the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ that we understand the true nature of power. So today, we're going to look at uh, three passages. One is Genesis 49. We're going to look at the lion. We're going to look at the shoot or the root of Jesse, Isaiah 11, a very uh, famous prophecy about the coming of Jesus. And we're going to look at the lamb, which is Revelations 5, 8. We're going to learn that for the lion, the metaphor of the lion, in Jesus, when God reveals uh, the lion, nature of power is to serve. The shoot, the aim of power is righteousness. And lastly, the lamb, the effect of power is transformation. Therefore, we learn from the lion, the root, and the lamb. Let's look at the nature of power. Now, we'll go back to Genesis 49. And here's a time where, where Jacob is about to pass on, he's gather his 12 sons together, and he's starting to distribute power. He's starting to prophesy and tell of their future. Genesis 49, then Jacob called his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. Assemble and listen to the sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. So here is a somber period of time. And I suppose Jacob understands this more than most because he's the one who tricked his father to give him the blessing when that time came. Now, each son comes forward and there is a defining characteristic of each son, which then determines the prophecy about his future. And here we have Reuben, the number one son, and he, this is what he says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the fruits, first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity, preeminent in power. Here is the guy who is number one, bristling with power. If he's anybody who worked out with, with, with biceps, that was him. He's the firstborn, his might, first fruits of his strength, preeminent in dignity, but unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence because you went up on your father's bed and then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. You know what happened? Reuben had sex with Jacob's concubine. And that's really demeaning and loss of face. So what happened to J Reuben? Reuben was the one who was most powerful, but he used his power for self-advancement. And that was his defining characteristic. The next Prophecy comes to Simeon and Levi. And Simeon and Levi, he says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. 
Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel. Oh, my glory, not be joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willingness they hamstrung oxen. So what they did was, because of the rape of their sister Dinah, they went into the men of Shechem, and they killed many, many men in retaliation for that one sin against sister. They had the power, and they used their power to dominate others. That was their defining characteristic. And because of that, Jacob cursed them. Cursed be they in their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel, will divide them into Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And finally, it comes to the fourth brother, Judah. The tune changes. Instead of cursing, he describes a blessing. And he says to Judah, Judah, your brothers, they'll praise you. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies, which means they will bow to you. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. This is, he's destined for glory. For everybody else, this is the one that got the blessing which everybody wants. And as an illustration of this blessing, Judah is like a lion's cub. From his prey, my son, you've gone up. He stooped low. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness who dares rouse him, which is a, a picture of power. He describes so the metaphor, the illustration of his power is like a lion. And if you look at the ancient Near East, the lion is a metaphor, image of great power. You can see this on the walls of Babylon, uh, statues and murals. There will be a blessing of royalty, the scepter which is the ruling stick, shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler staff from between his feet until tribute. This is, in the original Hebrew, is translated as Shiloh, which actually means Messiah, until the Messiah comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, which means people will be ruled by his descendant. And to illustrate how great this is, Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes, and he will be so beautiful. His eyes are darker than wine, his, eye, his teeth are whiter than milk. So here you have an illustration of how beautiful he is, illustration of how, how rich you will be because you don't take your donkey, you don't take your donkey's coat, you tie him to the vine because the vine is so precious and he's going to eat up the vine, right? And he washes his garments in wine, which is the same thing as if you win a race, you take a champagne, you pour all over the place, right? So that's a picture of abundance. Now, why of all the brothers, even Joseph, he doesn't get this. What is the defining characteristic of Judah? For him to get this blessing and not Joseph and, and not anybody else. What's so special about him? After all, this is a guy attempted murder of his brother. This is a guy who sold his brother into slavery. This is a guy who deprived his daughter-in-law of marrying his sons. And so therefore, he also had sex with his daughter-in-law. Nobody else has done that. If you look back at each of the patriarchs, book of Genesis, each of them have their own defining characteristics. Abraham, faith. Isaac, obedience. Jacob, struggling with God and submission to him. Joseph, obedience through all the difficulties in life. But what was the defining characteristic of Judah that made him deserve, as it were, this particular blessing? Well, it's sacrifice. Here was a situation where his Benjamin, the youngest brother, would have been trapped as the hostage because of a setup when they were in Egypt. Joseph had placed treasures in his bag and he was caught with it. And he would have been under the threat of being held as a slave in Egypt. It is through this dire situation where Judah stepped up and he said, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, Please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. What was Judah doing? This is a chap who sold Joseph. This is a chap who had sex with his daughter-in-law. This is a chap when the moment came when his brother's life was again under threat. He had changed. He had transformed. He offered himself to be a slave. And here we can see that true power the nature of true power is to be expended 
sacrificially in the service of others. Genesis 43, 8. When he talks to his father, he tells his father, I will be a pledge for Benjamin's safety. So here we have in Genesis 49, a comparison. Judah versus his three other brothers. Reuben, power for self. Simeon and Levi, power used to dominate others. Judah, power used to serve and to sacrifice. That is the nature of of true power, the power to serve. The second thing is that we understand that the aim of power is righteousness. Let's look at Isaiah, that famous prophecy in Isaiah about the coming of Jesus. We all know this. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots, and it shall bear fruit. So it's a stump from the Jesse, a shoot or a root, and a branch from his roots that shall bear fruit. Look at the prophecy. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of God. So here we actually have spiritual wisdom and might. So when Jesus comes, he will be a person, this Messiah will be the one where the spirit will rest on him, that he will have the spirit of wisdom and understanding and of might and knowledge. And then in Isaiah uh, 11, 3, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. What's Isaiah saying? When this Messiah comes, he will provide righteousness. People will be put into right relationship with each other. All the wrongs in the world, all the pain in the world will be relationship will be put right. And lastly, and he shall strike the earth with a rod of his mouth, with a breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be in the belt of his waist, and faithfulness his belt of his lions. And the last thing is actual justice. He will bring godly wisdom, righteousness, and justice. And the result of this, if you have godly wisdom, you've got righteousness, and you've got um, uh, justice, the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf, and the lion, and the fatted calf will, and the little children uh, shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, the young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. What righteousness achieves is perfect peace and flourishing among God's creation, which has now been torn apart. What righteousness will achieve is, is peace. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The power will come, and that right relationship requires accountability, and Jesus will bring that. And so when Jesus comes, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, all the generation from Abraham to David were 14 generations from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation of Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. There's a link. The Isaiah prophecy comes true from the Lion of Judah to the shoot of Jesse right down to Jesus Christ. See, all if you've seen recently in the United States elections, all elections are interactions of power. And even though you win an election, like Joe Biden did, the net result is still a power struggle. Half the country thinks he's a liar and he stole the election. Half the, half the country supports him. The, the net result is still this unity. The lion is not going to lie down with the lamb. It is not the idealized setting or the result which the Messiah will bring. Look at the recent conflict in Armenia versus Azerbaijan. You're fighting over a small piece of real estate called the Garo Karabakh. This is a place where ethnic Armenians are. In 1980 to 94, they, they had a great war there and thousands and thousands of people were killed. In the end, this area became semi-autonomous and ruled by the Armenians. And then now in the recent fight, Azerbaijan comes in and it then attacks this area and then ownership passes to Azerbaijan. And Russia supports Armenia, Turkey supports Azerbaijan. Again, the tussle of power never results in peace. It's just changing the furniture. 
Look at Scarborough Shoal, an idyllic island in the middle of the South China Sea, fighting over by China as Philippines. The World Tribunal, Court of Justice, has ruled that this belongs to the Philippines. China doesn't accept it. So you can actually have righteousness, but you, you could be a right part, side of the law, but if you don't have the power to enforce it, you can't do anything. I remember this uh, uh, very interesting movie called Bruce Almighty, where uh, Jim Carrey, acting as Bruce, was given the power of God. And people were emailing prayers to him. And what he did was, because he wanted to be a good God, he answered all the emails in the affirmative. Everybody, I want a, I want a cat for, 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 for my uh, pet. I want a horse. I want this. I want a million dollars. He answered everything in the affirmative because he was a good God. He thought, that's the way I will rule the world. I'm not like the current God. And in the end, there was great disaster because everybody's desires actually were in conflict with each other. The aim of righteousness is not to be used for yourself, but used to be served, to, to serve. But the aim of power is to actually achieve righteousness, right relationship with each other. Lastly, the effect of power is transformation. You look at the scene in heaven painted by the Apostle John. And what John hears is that there's a lion. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Why the people in heaven are actually weeping, the, the, the elders are weeping and the angels are weeping is because they have to open the scroll. There's this scroll that when you open it, it actually, the, the plan of God for salvation for the whole entire world is unfolded when the seals are broken. Nobody could actually touch it. Nobody could actually open it. Nobody could take this scroll from the right hand of God. And he says, who's going to do it? And the elders said to me, weep no more. John was weeping because nobody was qualified to take that stroll. And so therefore, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. So he can open the scroll and in its seven seals. That's what he hears. And what he sees is, and between the throne and the four living creatures, among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. What John hears is a lion. What John sees is actually a lamb. And so therefore, this mixed metaphor tells us the power of the lion resides in the lamb. It's paradoxical. And it's the most important paradox in the whole Christian experience that the power of the lamb, the lion, resides in the lamb. That's real power, real power for transformation. Mao Zedong said years ago, all political power comes from the barrel of a gun. Herod believed it. That's why he massacred the, all the children under two. And if you look at the history of the world where every dictator comes on, they use power to subjugate, but it all ends up badly. Look at Mao Zedong, the great leap forward. He forced, uh, took away farms from all the, the Chinese villagers and made them into collectives to improve output. He wanted to double the output of steel in his country in just one year, double it in one year. So he made them, everybody had a backyard homemade furnace and they burned, they used wood, they used furniture, they used trees. When they got no more uh, furniture, they used their houses to burn and to make very poor quality pig iron, which ended in disaster. And what happened was the great Chinese famine, where 18 to 45 million people lost their lives in famine because of this exercise of power. He wanted a revolution, but you can't achieve a revolution without transformation. Here's Paul Pot, 1975 to 1978. He thought all the evils of society are the rich people, the educated people, the people who subjugate the poor. So therefore, he started killing everybody who wore glasses, everybody who was, who was educated, everybody who was rich, all the teachers, all the nurses. He killed them all. And he marched everybody back into the villages to start over again, reboot called Year Zero. It didn't work out because you cannot transform men's hearts. What about Mahatma Gandhi? Mahatma Gandhi took a page from Jesus Christ. Revolutionary, non-violence. He stood against the British colonial powers. And he said, at first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they, then they fight you, and then you win. And he actually won using non-violent peaceful means. Against the British Empire, he overthrew them. 
Did it result in the lion lying down with the lamb and peace and righteousness in the world? It didn't because he, despite his efforts or using the Jesus-like principle, if you look at Kashmir, you look at uh, Bangladesh, you look at Punjab, it is a cauldron of seeding animosity and conflict even to this day. You cannot achieve it. The Crusaders thought all you have to do is put on the cross. The KKK says put on the cross and you can use power for yourself. The roots of evangelical political fervor is a retro report that came out recently that actually tracked how come 80% of white evangelicals in America support Donald Trump, who's clearly got character issues. Why is that? Actually, if you trace it from the retro report, it traces all the way back to Jimmy Carter, who called himself a Christian, and then he was, who took on the mantle of uh, the, the, the champion for the Christian cause, then it was Ronald Reagan, then it was George Bush. And each of them sided with the Christians, the Christians sided with them to gain political power to, to ensure righteousness in the land. However, it turned out badly. This is Cal Thomas, one of them who is a member of the moral majority, and he writes, the evangelicals are missing a greater point. If you're not careful, the political activism overwhelms the primary message, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only thing that is able to really truly change a life, and by extension change a nation, and no politician can fill that role. What he's saying is after a while, the evangelicals were so obsessed with going near the proximity to power that they forgot that their primary message is actually one in which you transform lives. Only Jesus Christ, only the gospel can transform life. Legislation cannot. And so therefore we come back to Christmas where the angels say, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day a city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We need a Savior. When the lion becomes a lamb, he becomes a savior. Transformation occurs when the lion is the lamb. When Jesus says, come to me, all you who burden, because I am gentle. He didn't come to serve, but to, serve, to, 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 to be served, but to serve. He didn't come to take up arms, but to take up a cross. He lays his life as an atonement of sin for all his people, and that precisely he's the most powerful when he's the most powerless. The most powerful moment in Jesus' life was when he was lying on the cross. When the lion becomes the lamb, power causes transformation. Christmas is not about giving. If you think it's all about giving, it's not. It's about dying. It's about giving up power. What about husband and wife? Bible tells you, Paul tells you, you have to, women are to submit, they don't like that. Men are to sacrifice. They don't like that either. And so there's a gap between submission. Because if I submit, but he doesn't sacrifice, I sacrifice and he doesn't, and she doesn't submit, there's a gap. You know what happens? The gap is filled by God's power and God's spirit. What about a victim and offender? How do we find forgiveness? How can I forgive that person who has hurt me so badly, who may have raped somebody in my family or hurt someone or murdered someone? How do I fill this gap? Well, Christ's death fills the gap, the gap between victim and offender. How can Jacob submit to his brother Esau? Joseph forgive his brothers. How can Jacob hang on to God instead of trying to overpower him? Each of them have understood that the center of power is when you actually give up power and you trust God to fill the gap in your life. Look at Abraham and Sarah promised to have a child and they waited 20 years. And in this 20 years, they tried to fill the gap. She tried to fill the gap with Hagar to give birth to Ishmael. Didn't work. He tried to fill the gap by saying, hey, oh Lord, I've waited this long time, so why don't you take my servant Eliezer? We see, we all try to fill the gap because we believe power is linear. And so therefore, who filled the gap? God filled the gap. God filled the gap with the son Isaac, ultimately. Because God fills in the gap, we can be other-centered and community-driven. We can be, instead of upwardly mobile, we can be downwardly mobile because we're trying to serve. We can attend to people's emotional and physical needs as well as their spiritual needs, and we don't have to be flashy, but we have to be enduring. You know why? 
God fills in the gap. I was watching a video recently of uh, Joseph Stowell, who, who was giving talks on the seven churches of um, Asia Minor. And he had received uh, information from Chinese Christian leaders who were being persecuted. And when he asked for their prayer points, uh, he would expect them to ask him to pray in America that God would lift away all the persecution. Actually, the Chinese leaders did not do that. You know what they asked? They asked that they pray, that they endure. They find endurance during this time of persecution. You know why? Because they believe God fills in the gap. It was Pastor Wang Yu, December last year. It was a pastor jailed for inciting subversion, which is what the Communist Party will do to you when you don't want to obey them. And uh, this is what he wrote uh, before he was thrown into prison. He says, if this regime is one day overthrown by God, it will be for no other reason than God's righteous punishment and revenge on this evil. For on earth, there's only ever been a thousand-year church. There has never been a thousand-year government. There's only eternal faith. There's no eternal power. How do we find endurance? Because God fills in the gap. Those who lock me up will one day be locked up by angels. Those who interrogate me will finally be questioned and judged by Christ. When I think of this, the Lord fills me with a natural compassion and grief towards those who are attempting to and actively imprisoning me. You see, how do we find forgiveness? Because God fills in the gap. And here we have a picture of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you a couple of pictures to end the sermon of Jesus Christ riding into Jerusalem for Passover. He rides a donkey instead of a stallion. And he's got children. You will notice every picture that I show you that will have Jesus riding a donkey and how the artists have uh, depicted him. Children always welcoming him. Again, here we can see the donkey with children before him and this last one. And it's a perfect picture of power. Kingdom power is unleashed by humility, vulnerability, and gentleness. The authorities crucify him not long after this. You know why? Because he's, uh, he, they assume he's after their power. You see, when we look at the lion, the root, and the lamb, how do you make a triumphal entrance? You ride on a donkey, not on a horse. How do you accomplish God's purpose? You die on the cross. Humility and gentleness is how you change the world. Being a servant of all unleashes the power of the kingdom. That is the message of Christmas. May God bless all of you as we meditate on the true nature of power in the lion, the root, and the lamb.